All right. <clears throat> so um, the research that I'm doing is related to narrative in macroeconomics um, and this concept of using text mining um, along with the widely available text data or that's becoming widely available um, as, as time progresses and um, some of the tools that we can use from the text mining field uh, from the natural language processing or computational linguistic field um, yeah, and so today uh, I won't be presenting any like concrete results on 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 on, uh, on necessarily economic information or, or economic of economic relevance. But it's only it's a start of, of the exploration into these tools and the available tools. And I'm sure Hilton afterwards also go into that. Um, but yeah, so. Um, thank you for your time, thank you for your attention, uh, and uh, let's start going. All right, so um, the purpose of this, of this work and of the PhD that I'm doing um, is to really try and assess the impact of information on, on economic shocks or on, on ec economic fluctuations and how information uh, communication, how transparency, how consistency of communication fits into the whole economic sphere. Um, and we'll, we'll get into what narrative means in a second. But uh, the, the, the question that we're asking today, roughly, is uh, what role does central bank narrative play in monetary policy shocks, right? Um, and a broader question that we have is, <clears throat> some of the broader questions that we have is, well, is narrative important for assessing economic shocks? Um, and can we actually use NLP techniques to accurately and importantly, objectively, find changes in, in the content, uh, in the changes and content of narrative. Um, I won't be answering any of these questions today, but I'll be alluding to some findings, some early findings that we have and, and, and trying to frame them in this context. So just to give you some context, um, there's a lot of authors, uh, especially in the economics field, that recently started publishing work on, on text mining and these natural language processing tools that, um, and how they can be used in the economic context. Um, like Gensko et al, that's a the paper is called Text as Data. It's a really important paper, I think, for going forward. Um, it talks about all the different techniques that are available. And it really explores a, a wide range of techniques available um, for text mining and, and creating latent features um, for, for economic modeling and economic inference and such, but they don't really give any results. It's just a, an overview of, of what's available to economists. Susan Athey also has a paper on it, uh, machine learning for economists. I think that's the paper's name. Um, Bolat et al, I think this is a text mining for central banks. They, it's for, uh, they at the, Central Bank of in England. Um, they wrote a paper following Gensko et al. basically and talking about these techniques and they give a, an implementation of a latent error location, which is a changes in policy with LDA. Um, and then Calvo Gonzalez, um, that is a World Bank. They're from the World Bank. They try to model, um, model uh, policy uh, volatility through using latent derelict allocations. So there's like volatility and uncertainty through changes in policies. Um, and then Hansen and McKenna, they, uh, they explored the FOMC, which is the American equivalent of the Monetary Policy Committee, right? Um, how that communication impacts real economic variables. Um, and they find some significant results, but, but um, it's really small. Uh, and this is expected, right? Especially when you're looking at uh, central bank narrative in developed countries, it's a really established institution and uh, it, it changes in, in the communication there doesn't have too much of an, of an impact on, on what happens in the markets, right? But the, the thing with all of these authors and all of the papers um, is that all of them talk about <clears throat> communication or text mining in a very disaggregated way, in a very separate way. Um, along comes Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winning economists and, uh, economist, and he frames it a bit different. He talks about the importance of assessing narrative 
in economics, right? This 2017 paper, um, Narrative Economics, there's a book that goes with it. It's a fantastic book. I recommend reading it. Um, and he talks about how narrative historically has impacted uh, economic shocks, like real economic shocks. Um, he talks about the Great Depression. He talks about a few recessions and where the word recession actually comes from and how that plays a role in the shocks. Um, so what he does is he really frames text, where text mining fits in the economic field through this idea of it being narrative. And it makes sense to think of it in that framework because we can have the consistency of a narrative, the transparency of a narrative, right? The fluctuation in narrative, et cetera. And we can really frame everything that's been done with text mining through this idea that it, it's a narrative that's changing, right? The sentiment of a narrative, that's another one, the content and the change in narratives. So it's really interesting work and it's really at the edge, um, at the edge and what that means that a lot of these techniques need to be explored. Uh, they are, they're really new, so nothing is certain. And, and I don't think anyone can say something with absolute confidence at the moment, as time progresses, the, the interpretation will become more accurate and the models will become actually more accurate. The dictionaries that are available will become broader and more inclusive of more, more concepts and such. But we'll get into that in a second. How this can help economists, right? Just at the moment, small, my small interpretation of it is, it's obviously a new data source for prediction and inference. Uh, I think really it's gonna help a lot with prediction. Um, depending conditional on the set of text that's available to to economists but for really short-term predictions um, modeling narrative and, and predicting fluctuations in, in the economy it might be an assistant to what's already been done i mean it, it's it'll just add to that and obviously inference it would be quite interesting to in real time infer what a narrative is and how that is affecting um, people's behavior, because that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. Um, narrative is something that people identify with and, and then act upon. Second, it can possibly help central banks in emerging countries to assess the, the impact of information they provide. So how important is, is the information that we're providing, especially central banks seeing how important the information is compared to how important the policy itself is. And then finally, um, help us better understand uh, the importance of nat narrative at a broader scale, right? So these tools, uh, we, can, we can try and, try and see how, how emerging narratives and, and growing narratives affect the economy as a whole, right? I mean, the uh, JFK, when they, when the US wanted to go to the moon, it, was a, it started off as a narrative, right? It's, there's no, I mean, there were obviously economic incentives. They were, it was during the time of the Cold War and there was a race going on, but to convince everyone uh, to take this on and to actually invest money in it, et cetera, it, it, it does, some of it is, is a narrative, is, is a narrative effect. It's the same thing with Donald Trump getting 17 million people to vote for him, right? There's, there are some economic reasons. This is not my place to talk about it, really any of this stuff. But there, there is this component of narrative and an idea that drives these, these uh, choices that, that, that the public actually takes. So that's some of the context. Now, defining narrative, it's actually not, we're not really defining narrative per se, but we're just pointing to some of the propositions of what a narrative can be. According to Schiller, I put a bit of flavor in there myself, but this is basically it. Um, narrative, uh, narratives are ideas that have found ground in, uh, in a proportion of the human population, basically. It, in essence, it's an idea that people identify with. And the more people identify with this idea, the more, uh, the bigger this idea becomes, the bigger this narrative becomes really. It becomes a narrative where people add more ideas to the story and it accumulates some form of momentum and then, and then we can actually monitor it as a narrative. So a second thing about it is uh, important economic narratives might comprise a very small percentage of popular talk. Now what this means is like, this is, this is perfect for the central bank. Not too many people 
in the public uh, talk about, in the populist talk about what the central bank talks about, right? Okay, change the repo rate, this happens. But it is, it is definitely of economic importance what they talk about and why they talk about it, right? So some ec economic relevant narratives might not be uh, a, a viral narrative in which uh, everyone talks about it, right? Um, another another point is that narratives are constellations. Uh, narrative constellations are more impactful than a single narrative. And this essentially means that narratives, when you deal with something like latent derelict allocation, which is a topic model, um, one topic can actually be comprised of a bunch of different topics. And, you, and there's this hierarchy structure to it where you can look at an aggregate narrative and then break it down into a bunch of smaller narratives and it's actually the same thing with topic modeling especially um, when you're dealing with quite a small data set there's uh, there's a lot of uh, variation in, in, in the interpretation and then narratives can mutate over time so this is another important point narratives change over time and so topics change over time and it's difficult to model that underlying uh, narrative that underlying idea and then finally, uh, reinforcement of narratives also matter, right? So narratives might change, but you need to reinforce this narrative, especially like, for instance, with forward guidance. The idea that forward guidance is important is a thing that you have to kind of reinforce also over time that the expectations that the central bank set are quite important. Once again, uh, I'm not trying to say anything in this presentation to say I'm not trying to uh, say this is this is an important factor this is not an important factor I'm just exploring what's out there and then hoping to get some 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 comments in return yeah so the journey so far just quickly um, the NLP techniques that are available for narrative the first one being sentiment models you can extract the sentiment of a narrative n-gram models which is you just select a few words from text that's exploring the defining words for narratives. That's another thing you can do. Latent derelict allocation, which is topic modeling. You can do a deeper exploration of content and a change of narratives, right? So you can actually go and do some inference work with latent derelict allocation. And then finally, word embeddings. Um, it's more accurately explore change in narratives. Now, word embeddings come from neural networks that are specifically language neural networks that are, that are made to predict words. Um, and when you try and predict the next word, you actually get this nice underlying uh, or latent space that gives you a representation of what a combination of words look like. And that's called a word embedding. So our journey so far, uh, the NLP models that we've explored, um, we've looked at sentiment models, n-gram magnetic allocation and word embeddings. I'm just gonna quickly talk about some of the issues with it because going into assessing this narrative, et cetera. It's, it's, it's really complicated because first of all, it's really new and not too many people are a part of the conversation at the moment. Hopefully that changes. Um, but the, it, some people kind of shoot from the hip when it comes to these things. Um, and, and it's important to understand the issues that are related with it. And some of the issues, these are the issues that we've encountered with it. So the first one, sentiment models. The issues that are that language changes over time and word combinations determine sentiment, especially for economic information, and this is important. Some, some models deal with this issue, like balance models, balance aware models, um, but they're not really trained for economic context. And this is um, probably my lack of knowledge in dictionary approaches, because sentiment models are, are basically dictionary approaches where you map a, a word to a positive or negative value or a grouping of words to a positive or negative value. Um, excuse me for the spelling mistakes I have. I see economic with two C's. Uh, this keyboard that I'm using is quite broken. Um, <clears throat> so um, sentiment models are great, um, but I think the, the non-parametric relationship between economic information or economic words is, is really where the work needs to be done for, for economists, I believe. Um, then secondly, related to the change in language, and um, what's going to have multiple meanings given the context. And the, the real issue is framing the context in real time, uh, like in a dynamic way. There's a lot of research of bias that goes into selecting engrams of, uh, of narratives. And it's also very high level. It's a very high level uh, view of what's going on. But it is important, like Robert Schiller uses a lot of engrams in his book and 
and use it to define um, narratives. So it is, it is definitely useful. Latent theory allocation. So uh, there are a lot of issues with using LDA. Um, it's like determining the right hyperparameters uh, are difficult. You need to do a lot of uh, uh, runs through models and <clears throat> topics can also be disaggregated into more topics. And especially with small uh, data sets, the problem is that um, you might reach a global um, or local maxima, but that is not a global maxima approximation for the topics. And the problem then becomes you, you, um, you don't get the right set of topics or there might be a more diverse set of topics that make sense, but the model like the coherence scores and the perplexity scores aren't really representing that. Um, another problem with LDA is, is uh, when you have something like economic text, um, it's really dense, focused on one category, and it will tend to model topics together uh, that we as economists wouldn't interpret it as such, but it definitely sees that this is a grouping and it's because it doesn't have a diverse set of, of information to model on. Also, you need a lot of text if you want to get those diverse set of topics. And then finally, word embeddings through neural networks. Um, the issues are that inference is really difficult, um, determining what word embeddings mean. And then you also need a large corpus to train. And this is similarly the problem with latent data allocation, where when you, use, when you want to train a model on word embeddings, um, it uses gradient descent. And the problem that you run in, in, into is that you can get a local minima for gradient descent, but you might not get a global minima. And, and um, that is a problem. So you really need a large, large uh, data set to do this. Luckily, there are some, um, some, some models out there, some pre-trained word embedding models. And today we'll be using one of them, um, one of Google's models, to extract some word embeddings. So let's focus on, on today. There, there was now a lot of information with regards to uh, narrative. What are we talking about today? So today we'll be using only two, I'm talking about two models, um, latent data lake allocation with GIP sampling, and then Google's universal sentence encoder for word embeddings. Now Google's universal sentence encoder is one of the uh, main models that they use for searching, for their search engine. And it's basically a big neural network trained on a lot, a huge amount of text data. Just imagine what Google has to their disposal. And so it's a big uh, language neural network that's been trained on that. And uh, it gives us the ability, they luckily had a Python package for it. And so we could uh, uh, download the Python package or download the model and then extract word embeddings with our documents. So we avoid training on a small data set for, for, uh, for the neural networks. And a great thing that we can do is actually, we can compare the LDA that we run with the, with, the, with the word embeddings that we get from Google. And this gives us an anchor in which we can assess the latent direct allocation, the, the topics that we get from the topic model. And this is actually quite, uh, quite a nice innovation. That, I mean, it's, it's not, too much of an innovation, but it is a nice thing that you can incorporate with your with your topic modeling in the future, with um, text mining in the future. Is try and try and see what the difference in topic distributions from LDA is compared to the difference in the word embeddings uh, from from something like this Google's model. Um, uh, but this is also just preliminary work. The work needs to go into making a a economic specific word embeddings model. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end. So the data that we use is unstructured text data from the South African Reserve Bank Monetary Policy Committees, a communication. Um, unstructured being it's text data, so you need to find a way to structure it. Um, and then it's, it's bi-monthly communications from 2000 to 2020. Now we train the latent derelict allocation model and we ex extrapolate the, or extract the word embeddings with this data set. But we run some regressions in which we actually use from 2003 to 2020, and this is because our dependent variable is, is limited to, to, to that time. Now, um, the regressions that we run, right, the, uh, which, which I'll get to. Um, our dependent variable is principal components fitted to Bloomberg tickets with rotational matrix uh, around the time of communication to construct short, medium, and long-term compositive practice. Now, what I just said, I have, I have 
I'm not the person to talk to you about this. Uh, Ekaterina Pirushkova and uh, Professor Nikola Vieji, they are the people uh, that can more inform, inform the audience about this. Um, but basically, the idea is to assess monetary, uh, monetary policy shocks, and they try and model the short, medium, and long-term shocks, right? And that's where these factors come from. So short, medium, and long-term factors. Now, those are not all really, I mean, I'm, when I'm saying this, I'm doing them in great injustice in saying this, but the short, medium, and long-term factors is what they want to model. There's still a bit of uncertainty with regards to the medium and long-term composite factors, but they're quite confident about the, 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 the short-term factor. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. But um, basically what we want to do, what I want to do is try and see where narrative fits in the monetary policy shock itself, um, in the contractionary expansionary shocks and where narrative, what kind, what part of narrative fits into the short and the medium and the long-term. And maybe narrative can help explain the short, medium, and long-term composite factors, specifically the medium and long-term factors. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm pretty sure Professor uh, Nicola would be more than willing to answer them. Uh, I think good time for, for that. All right, and so uh, uh, what we try and regress on that is a change of word embeddings and latent topics extracted from the bi-monthly communications. So we just try and regress the change in what we perceive to be the change in narrative from both the word embeddings and the topic modeling, and then we regress the topic modeling. So just, uh, uh, yeah, all right. So just to give you an idea, these are what the factors look like. This is F2 and IRF2. F2 being the medium, so the policy horizon two year, uh, the factor that looks the, at shocks towards the two year, two year um, uh, shocks. Um, don't know how to frame it, to be quite honest, but negative values means it's a expansionary monetary policy shock, and the positive values mean it's a contractionary policy shock. And it, they they get to this because uh, it's quite correlated with the change in interest rate, the increase in the interest rate or in the repo rate is correlated with the with the positive value, and the same with the negative, a drop in, in the repo rate. So these are what the factors look like. This is just one of the factors. The IRF, I should probably do that. The F2 and IRF2. So F2 is a is a shock that includes both um, what they believe to be the shock from the policy itself, and then the shock from the information provided by the central bank. And then the IRF2 is just the shock of the of the policy itself, right? And um, this comes with a lag. Uh, a lag is imposed because they need to verify that the shock, um, and so. So basically, IRF2 is controlling for that informational component, right? And the difference between the two is, uh, should be quite interesting for narrative as well. But uh, let's move on. All right, so just quickly, last steps. Uh, we just extract the word embeddings from the, <clears throat> and calculate the Euclidean distance. So that's the, how we get the distance between the word embeddings or between the documents. This is our proxy for the change in narrative. And then we calculate the same thing for the top distributions. We take the Euclidean distance and we correlate those. So the Euclidean distance between each topic distribution and the following documents topic distribution. And the same thing for the word embedding. <clears throat> and we see which model, which topic model has the highest correlation with the, with the word embeddings. And this is how we choose our latent dialect allocation model. Actually, the amount of topics that we need, the hyperparameters that we're using, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on this, but at the moment we have it at 95% correlation between change in topic distribution and change in word embeddings. So we try and model the, the LDA to be as close as possible to the change in the word embeddings because the word embeddings are is more of a universal approximation for, 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 for the change in narrative. Uh, it's because it's modeled on a, a lot more information than text data. Then we regress both the change in word embeddings and the change in topics on the factors. And then we regress the change in optimal topics on the factors to identify important topics, right? Um, this is just preliminary work, as I said. There's no, um, I'm not saying anything today, I'm not, not saying anything economic today, I suppose. It's just econometric stuff. So, our preliminary results, our expectations are set quite low by Anson and McCannon. They find a quite small relationship between 
change in communication and change in real variables, real economic variables. Um, but narrative might play a more important, a more prominent role in emerging markets than developed ones. Um, I'm not going to go into this. I'm not saying it's true. It's just something we think at the moment it might be true, might be possible. Um, but really finding any relationship between changes in narratives and monetary policy shocks, both derived from unsupervised models, from a qualitative and a quantitative data sets and quantitative data sets, um, should be interesting and beautiful for the research, right? And this is, I'm kind of alluding to what, what we get there. There is some relationship, and that's really the interesting takeaway about it is, is these two models, supervised and unsupervised, are two unsupervised models, both on quantitative data and one on qualitative data. So coming from two different perspectives, there is some relationship and that's quite the interesting part of it. So just quickly, this is that F2, IRF2 and the Euclidean distance for the word embeddings. At first I tried to look at the change in narrative and that's how I'm gonna frame the, the distance in the word embeddings. Um, the change in narrative relative to, to the, the monetary shock contractionary or expansionary and it's difficult because narrative might change for both um, contractionary and expansionary reasons so what i just did at the start is just see uh, is there a relationship between the change in narrative and a shock right not assuming anything about contractionary or expansionary was there a shock and was there a change in narrative and that's what this is the, the red bars are the F2, so that's the informational and the policy component. IRF is just the, uh, uh, um, IRF2 is just the, is the blue bar, it's just the policy shop itself. And then the green dots is uh, the Google Universal Sentiment Center, word embedding distance. So that's the Euclidean distance, our proxy for narrative. Great, um, just to give you an idea what it looks like. Now, some of the regressions that we ran. Uh, the wording is, uh, might not be too intuitive. So on the left-hand side, we have the Euclidean distance. I, just to tell you, I had constants in the regressions. I just took the constants out. Um, so this is the Euclidean distance for the universal sentence encoder and then the change in repo rate. So that's Euclidean distance and change in repo rate. Sorry, change in repo rate. It's the same thing with the Euclidean distance and the change in repo rates, so basically, a positive or a negative value, etc. And up top, we have the factor one, which is the short term factor, factor two, the medium term, and factor three, the long term. Once again, I'm talking about this really roughly. This is by no means any, any concrete uh, statements that I'm making. And then the IRF one, absolute value, IRF two. So these are just like changes in narrative related to, to monetary shocks. Um, uh, that's the first first table that you see. The second table is actually where I take the positive um, values, and this is gonna be a theme going through the regressions. Uh, I just take the positive values separately and then the negative values separately. The positive being the contractionary shocks. So just to go back one slide, uh, maybe a few slides. Um, so I basically make everything zero that is not positive and make everything zero that is not negative. Um, and say, well, there was a negative shock to the economy, there was a positive shock to the economy, and I break the regressions down like that, right? And so first, Euclidean distance, we see some um, positive uh, and significant relationships between, between short-term and medium-term factors. So what this basically says that a change in narrative is related to a shock, right? Uh, for both a change in narrative was related to a short-term shock and a long-term shock. And when we go over to the, when we control for the change in the repo rate itself, um, uh, the results kind of still, still hold to some extent, right? And uh, so basically that's, uh, that's basically what, we, what I'm saying is that the change in narrative just from this perspective, right? And obviously there's a bunch of things more to control for and a bunch of quantitative variables still to explore. But just for what, what we did there, there's some relationship here between change in narrative and change in shock. That's what this one and this one means. And that's quite an interesting finding considering that these are from two separate models done with two separate ideas um, initially. And they've just kind of put them together and trying to see what the relationship is. And, and I mean, coming from text data and then coming from, from the Bloomberg data 
around the time of the communication, it's, it, it, that's an interesting result in itself. Then when we do the regression for the positive, we actually see um, some significant coefficients, but it's not, uh, at the moment, nothing really interesting there. Uh, and the, when we do the regression for the negative, uh, we, see, we see some, some significance for a negative shock, so it's an expansionary shock, right? So in the short term, and then when we control for the interest rate, there's an expansionary uh, relationship between changing narrative and an expansionary shock uh, for the short term and medium term factors, which is, a, which is an interesting result. Um, once again, nothing's con concrete, but it's an interesting result. And so just to confirm, uh, to do the same regression with a latent derelict allocation. So I once again took the Euclidean distance uh, for the topic distributions, and this is at a 95% correlation with the Euclidean distance for the universal sentence encoder from Google. We see the same results, right? Which is what we expected. This is good, that, we, that we're able to anchor an LDA. The, the results uh, for the absolute value, so for the shocks, the results change up a bit for the, for the contractionary shocks. That's when the interest rate goes up. So the results change a bit. Um, still a lot of investigation and, and uh, understanding needs to be done to get any, like, any real concrete information. But it's an interesting finding. And, and now uh, for the negative shocks, the signs are still the same, but the, but the coefficients are now insignificant. insignificant. Um, but it's interesting. It is a kind of intu an intuitive result. When you change the narrative, there's a shock. And there is a reverse relationship there as well, right? Um, where you have to change narrative. Sometimes you change narrative because you want to set a precedent. Sometimes you change narrative because you have to respond to something that's happening globally. And so still a lot of research needs to be done in that area. Um, and just to give you guys an idea of what the topic distribution looks like, I'm running out of time. Right, yeah, I'm almost out of time. The topic distribution looks like this. I'm not gonna go, I'm just gonna skip this slide. Um, we see that some topics are, are quite distant from all the other topics. Um, and these topics are actually interesting because when we run the regressions, we see some of these topics uh, are correlated with the shocks. And so this is also an interesting finding. We can actually assign some topics to shocks. Uh, and then obviously we want to actu actually find out which topics are related to positive shocks and which topics are related to negative shocks. When I say positive and negative, I just mean the positive values for the factors. So the, 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 the topics, um, these ones, topic one, topic two, uh, they, uh, they're not just for interest. We, I had a look at the topics and uh, I mean, afterwards, we, someone might want to look through these topics with me um, to kind of figure out the shock, right? These topics, uh, topic one, topic two, topic three, I'm not going to label them because that's also very, uh, kind of ambiguous question to, to approach as a researcher. And then the same thing with the negative uh, shocks, which topics are related to the negative shocks. And here we actually see some, some topics related to the negative shocks. Um, <clears throat> these are those topics related to them. Uh, topic three, petrol strike, I'm not sure. Uh, inflation remains statement global. And then topic nine, forecast, tightening, uh, political, unchanged, positive. Uh, it, there's still a lot of uh, filtering, I suppose, needs to be done, but it's also, it's, it's, it's quite a difficult question to answer about how much filtering you do with the, the words that you use. All right, and I think uh, there's just all the topics. I think we'll skip this one. And then to conclude, some interesting outtakes. Well, um, there seems to be some relationship between output from two unsupervised models, both quantitative and qualitative data. That's the interesting thing. Possible, it's possible to model narrative in some capacity. It's really getting to actual narrative is going to be the challenge. Um, some slight signs that empirically narrative might have some relationship with shocks. Well, there were some, some signs, but this can be really scrutinized. And yeah, still a lot of work needs to be done. We need to build a panel with more countries, explore more text data, possibly Twitter, explore more quantitative metrics and uh, 
train economic wear embeddings and the LDA models. And this is really an important thing that needs to be done. Models need to be trained specifically for the economic context. And then finally, an ultimate goal would be to summarize narratives in real time. Awesome. All right. I'm done. Cool. Hello. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. I think, um, yeah, there's, it's, it's really important to look at how we can use all these resources. And um, we do have some questions coming in on our chat. So the first one is, how are monetary policy shocks identified? Is it simply the change in the policy <clears throat> rate? Um, yeah, so that's one. Maybe I should answer that. Yes, thank you. You want me to answer that? <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Uh, we took this policy shock from another study that we do. Uh, they were doing with uh, Caterina, uh, Caterina and uh, Giovanni. That essentially is an high frequency, these are shocks uh, uh, derived from an high frequency identification of shocks on a, on a VAR, on a monetary policy VAR. And uh, uh, with this decomposition of short run, medium run, and long term effect uh, shocks for uh, the, the short run is, uh, is directly policy shock, the medium run is the uh, the shocks that have an effect uh, sort of the policy horizon, zero to two, and then the long term that is supposed to uh, identify some form of uh, quanti of uh, forward guidance uh, element of the policy shock. And therefore, there is this parallel work that is looking at the quantitative identification of, of the shocks and uh, identification of how much of the shocks is pure policy shock and how much is information shock from a quantitative point of view. Therefore, we had that work and therefore uh, we, thought, we, uh, we thought to try to test the qualitative analysis or narrative to see how it correlates from, with uh, another you know, information definition that comes from a quantitative analysis. So in a sense, you know, every time we try to, we enter in this new technique, a lot of the proof is in the pudding, in the sense that yeah, it will be also for uh, Hilton uh, next presentation. Is at uh, one moment that we need to test how much this uh, this qualitative analysis, how much really correlated with what we know, so that we can give a, a an interpretation, give us some guidance of what in which direction we, we should go. And therefore, the fact that as as Chara was saying that these two different approaches, qualitative and quantitative, find the point of correlation, just to reinforce the idea, okay, that in this uh, uh, textual analysis, there is really something interesting or we should even move forward because it goes in the direction of at least give an explanation or give an, some guidance in that uh, direction. That is what uh, Charles was saying. But, you know, the, uh, is, uh, uh, the shocks essentially are coming are coming from from another another work with Katharina. Okay, great. So we also have another question. You from answer the, chat. the you answer the next. Uh, okay. I, 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 <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah, no worries. Great. So um, we have some questions coming in um, from participants, but there's also one in the text mm -hmm. um, which says. Um, from Kerbetswe, he says, if I'm correct, you derive narratives from the LDA. And if you say, and if you say change in narrative is associated with the repo change, can you give an example of such an instance from the data? Um, so this is where it becomes complicated when you want to try uh, and model qualitative data into quantitative data, right? Um, I haven't read through this particular sections where there were shocks. I haven't read through all of the documents where there were shocks to give you an example, to be honest. Um, so the, at the moment, it's just a base, a basis by which we are trying to assess changes in narratives and trying to actually see whether this is something to explore. So uh, definitely I need to, to go and, and prepare more examples of this was where there was a change narrative but it also requires for me to understand a lot better what the what the bank when they communicate about something why they're communicating about it and then the next period why they are so at the moment no I don't have a have a have an example of where the narrative changed where this 
with the reaper rate change. So I'll, I'll come with a better example next time, but it's a good question. Thank you. Cool. Great. Okay, next up we have Andrea who would like to ask a question. Can you hear us, Andrea? Hello. Oh, I don't know if Andrea. Margot, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Charles and Nicola. It's a, it's a great piece of work. Um, Charles, I think I've heard you talk about this in the past and it's uh, really fascinating. So thank you. Um, I have maybe a comment and two questions. So the comment is, uh, it's quite counterintuitive to think that um, changes in narrative play a more prominent role in EM, where, you know, in developed markets, it's forward guidance um, is kind of more actively used and taken a lot more seriously. I think as a policymaker, you see uh, at the zero lower bound forward guidance is used more actively. And so you would think that um, that, that would be a more influential factor uh, in, in DM rather than EM. Um, so maybe something to, to mm -hmm. guide your future research or to bear in mind, are you seeing as though mm -hmm. you said you wanted to look at other countries? Mm -hmm. um, and then my question is, I guess it, I've got two questions. It, in part, it's been explained by Nicola. I was also asking about identification of shocks. Um, but I was also curious when, when you presented or you put up your chart on the factors, F2 and the um, IRF chart, uh, I couldn't help but notice that there were contractionary shocks um, at the beginning of this year, January 2020. And if my understanding was correct, that, well, my, if my understanding is correct, that's a contraction shock, but that was also a time where the stock cut the repo rate and it was a surprise decision at the time. The market was not pricing that cut. Um, so maybe, maybe the question goes to Nicola then to help me understand why the framework is picking up a contraction shock when there was a surprise rate cut in, in January of this year. And then second one, perhaps more for you, Shal, is, um, I'm interested in what sort of autocorrelation you can find in this narrative. Um, is, 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 is autocorrelation in a narrative something that you can chart by some other way? I'm curious to understand how much momentum there is in what the Saab is saying from one meeting to the next. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, let me try and answer the autocorrelation. Um, so this is another thing that I'm quite interested in. It's basically the momentum of the narrative, right? So what's the uh, what's the momentum of, of of a particular narrative, and a, and the, like the increase in the decline of narratives? This is basically that question in a sense. Um, and so no, I haven't looked into it, um, but it should be interesting to. See to try and break that apart, the, 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 once again, the problem becomes, the problem first is identification, proper identification of, of a narrative or a change in narrative, right? And this is only that, an exploration into that. It's not on, on, on particular information because you wanna see the autocorrelation of the change in narrative, but also the different types of narrative out there. So this is an important point. Also, is to try and like one of the metrics is to try and assess the the momentum of change in in a, in the central bank. I suppose in, in central banks. That's a, it's a great question, but no, yeah, I'm, I mean I haven't done it yet. Uh, it's a good point. I just wrote it down. Thanks. Um, I yeah, yeah. Okay. One, <laughs> no, I didn't want. Yeah, uh, sorry. We should probably wait for uh, for the other paper to come out to, before presenting this one or to connect the two. Yeah. Um, but the only thing is, actually, uh, if you look at these three shocks, uh, we have the short run, there is a big uh, expansionary shock. Therefore, the, the understanding of this is in relation to what's happened to the other three components. Uh, therefore, it's a bit, uh, uh, therefore, this one, if you want, is, uh, it's an, uh, is an information, uh, sorry, the expansionary uh, change gave you some information about the contractionary nature of what was coming forward. And therefore, it's not 
uh, it doesn't mean there was a contractionary monetary policy, but was a contractionary set of information about the future. The policy shock, there is a, an expansionary policy shock. These also give us some information about the future. Therefore, but uh, you know, I don't want to spend uh, more time on on this because it was just somehow we could uh, relate them with uh, with this narrative, uh, but uh, obviously just as a preliminary preliminary work. Okay. We will come with the other paper. Great, mm. yeah. And um, there's just one more question, which also may be more relevant in the next one for Hilton, but how do we choose which words determine the narrative? Oh, can you hear me? Uh, sorry, you just disconnected. Oh, sorry. Me. Sorry about that. Um, there was just one more question, which also may be more relevant um, with Hilton's paper. But how do you choose which words determine the narrative? This is an important, very important question. Um, this is where the different types of models also comes into play. Like, for instance, with dictionary, uh, dictionary approaches, you have to be sensitive to the words that you're using, but it's also conditional on the, on the available dictionary that you have, the word mappings that you already have, and the models that have been trained to predict even out of sample words of the sen sentiment. Um, so that's, Hilton will probably speak more to that. Um, but there's another important question there. Um, this is also where a researcher, with a bias that a researcher has towards the text that they are using, um, might also complicate their results or it's a very fine line to walk where you decide what to include and what not to include and what to consider being relevant information and what's irrelevant because you can you can change these models to to kind of get what you want in a sense and I I use standard uh, text cleaning and text mining practices with this I, I had no filtering of words. That's why you see some words that don't make any sense in the topics. Um, because you, you, a researcher really needs to take an unbiased approach to try and model, model the text and have a feedback mechanism with the models that you're using. Instead of imposing your, what you want to, to extract exactly. And I mean, it's a very sensitive question that's conditional on what you're trying to work on as well. Um, but you need to be careful in not, uh, not isolating everything that you believe to be the important set of information and then allocating the narrative to that and really let the model speak for itself in a way. Um, at first, at least, right? You need, to, you need to kind of, the model has to try and capture the variation and not you as a researcher, the variational, variation in text and, and in narrative. Um, yeah, okay. that's... that's what I have to say. Yeah. Oh, thank you.